Thanks so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm at UCL, and so is Johannes, uh, who's going to present the second part of this tutorial. This has also been work with Dirk, who can't be here today, but who has been helping us a lot with developing the slides and the tutorial in general. OK, so uh, some of you might have seen these news a couple of months ago on robots that can now read better than humans, uh, putting millions of job at risk. Uh, so I, I, that alone should be a good reason to, to talk about machine reading here. Um, you definitely want to know all about it. As you can imagine, uh, in reality, the way these news should really sound like is something like robots can still or can now pattern match on a benchmark data set better than humans. Um, so definitely we're not yet uh, there. We're not reading like machines in any way. Uh, sorry, machines are not reading like uh, humans in any way. Uh, but nevertheless, there has been a lot of pro progress in the last couple of years on what is called machine reading and activity in this space has really skyrocketed. So I think it's still a really good time to talk about machine reading. Let me start by asking what is machine reading? Um, and so the definition or interpretation of that term actually has changed quite a bit throughout the, I guess, last uh, 30 years or so in the sense that if you look at the literature before around 2006, uh, what it meant back then was something else entirely compared to what we now think of machine reading. Namely, it was about making these, uh, these machines that uh, can read, say, license, pl license plates and, and recognize characters on these license plates, so, which is interesting enough, uh, but not really what is now today understood as machine reading. And, and what is it now, at least part of it, is um, based on work that Oren Etzioni at UW uh, and others have been doing starting around 2006, where they use this term to describe uh, essentially the process of going from unstructured text to some symbolic representation of the meaning of that text, such that that you know, uh, representation can be used downstream by a machine or maybe a human alike. Uh, and you can see that this logo here is actually something that came out of the DARPA machine reading grant uh, that also got established around that time. And this logo is kind of interesting because it doesn't just show you, I guess, a, a robot that is kind of doing reading. But actually, if you look into the picture in a bit more detail, you see that there is uh, a thing that the robot is writing. And what the robot is writing here is essentially a uh, logical representation of what it has just read. And that was really the interpretation and still is the, uh, the interpretation of machine reading at that time, sort of taking text, mapping it to symbolic representations. Then, I guess, uh, since about 2014, roughly aligned with when deep learning really hit NLP, uh, there came a new sort of interpretation of the term machine reading, namely the idea of end-to-end -end question answering, where generally you have some kind of question in natural language, uh, some text in natural language, and uh, some relatively deep neural network that takes this text and then maps it to an answer. And that has been one really quite dominant interpretation of the term machine reading. In this tutorial, I'm trying to essentially draw a bigger picture that encompasses both of these interpretations. Um, but it's still worthwhile to, to really understand that there has been a quite dramatic paradigm shift in the way that we look at uh, machine reading. Um, Naturally, this tutorial is not about the first part of, uh, or the first interpretation of machine reading, but the other two, um, which are in the literature also often referred to or definitely related to terms like information extraction, semantics and semantic parsing, and question answering. And when you actually look at uh, NLP conferences, there are specific areas or one area for this whole domain of uh, information extraction, semantics, question answering, and today, by far, that is the most prominent, most busy area of research in terms of submissions that we see there. So it's definitely a big topic within NLP. Um, as for the contact, uh, content of this, this tutorial, um, what we try to do is give you some context in terms of what is machine reading uh, and why should we care about it, uh, talk about basic methods in there, uh, the paradigms of machine reading, and the models that we use in machine reading to uh, produce these kind of representations. We'll talk a lot about challenges 
why is it hard, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of the current models. And that's partially in order to get guess, your community's feedback and input into our challenges there. Uh, we also briefly touch on data sets and uh, software that you can use to work in this area. So, I guess chronologi chronologically, the, the tutorial will be a uh, part one, uh, where I'm going to talk about text to symbolic representations, and a part two, where Johannes is going to talk about end to end question answering. Um, okay, so machine reading. And I kind of briefly touched on that as well, but just to make it more concrete and uh, like uh, more explicit, the way that we think about it is as being given a text, which a machine then converts into some kind of representation of the meaning of that text, which is then used by some machine to satisfy some information need. The way that we see you as the UAI community and the audience of this, uh, of this uh, tutorial is A, as potential downstream users of uh, machine reading, but also as people who can innovate on machine reading. Because really, the kinds of uh, techniques and problems we are solving there, they're overlapping heavily with what you do at UAI. So uh, we're going to need a lot of help. So why should we care about machine reading? I think there are two high-level reasons. One is the sort of standard information overload reason. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a graph of the number of publications in PubMed over the uh, last couple of hundred or so years. And you can see that there is a uh, exponential increase in that number, which means that for people it's really hard to solve the basic information needs in an effective way. And if you had machine reading technology that can take this and answer your question right away, uh, then certainly this will be helpful downstream for these users. Another way I like to think about machine reading is as a solution for a really important AI problem, like the problem of knowledge acquisition. As I mean, some of you may know, like there has been in the old days of AI, uh, usually um, a lot of focus has been on, on sort of getting knowledge into the machine. Like machines could do a lot of things, but they could not really compete with us because they didn't have the right domain and background knowledge. And hence, people spend a lot of time manually creating knowledge representations that the symbolic AI reasoners could use to better uh, solve the task that they looked at. And in a way, you can think of machine reading as an automate, automated solution to this problem where um, symbolic representations that machines can use get automatically extracted from text, and hence uh, addressing this bottleneck problem. Um, there's a wide range of applications starting from basic question answering um, to, for example, helping agents to learn faster. So this has been work done at MIT in 2012 where uh, a um, sort of civil civilization, the game, manual, was used to improve our, uh, or a, an agent's ability to play the game civilization. And that's, again, like one instance of machine, machine reading. Um, precision medicine is another application area where what you see there on the left is a, a molecular tumor board, uh, which are essentially doctors that look at the DNA sequence of a tumor and then read through a lot of literature to figure out what is the best drug combination that we could use for this particular patient. Obviously, this doesn't really scale. Uh, and having machine reading as a tool in this, in this setup could really make a difference. And Hoifong Poon, actually a, a UAI uh, alumni that, that has been published here a lot, has been really working a lot on this. Uh, another thing you might want to do is uh, find conflicting information in, uh, in news. So I don't know, during the, the, the days before the Brexit decision, there were conflicting numbers reported about how much the UK actually feeds uh, every month to uh, the EU. And uh, it would be great if you can automatically extract representations from text that allow you to find these mismatches and resolve these conflicts, and so on and so forth. So that's in terms of applications. What about uh, approaches. I'm just going to give you a high-level overview now, and then we're going to go into much uh, more depth later. Um, so I guess one approach is, is what's called semantic parsing, where the idea is to take a sentence or maybe a paragraph or maybe a document 
and map that to a first order logic representation. And uh, like the one here in the example. That's uh, usually done in a way that you try to capture quite a lot of the detailed nuances of language um, and, and get a really high precision representation of what's said there. I, I say this because this is to be contrasted with what is called automated knowledge-based construction, which is the process of taking a collection of documents and mapping them to something like a knowledge graph, where you have as nodes entities that are described in this document and as edges relations, semantic relations between these um, entities as expressed in the document that you have. And uh, I'd like you to sort of remember this because this will be at least the focus of the first part of this talk. Another alternative approach is what I briefly mentioned earlier, the idea of end-to-end -end machine comprehension, where I have some information need, like usually a question, uh, and this, this question is directly fed into a neural architecture in which, um, together with a representation of the document that you get, an answer is directly put out. And um, I think this is a very interesting instance of essentially the general paradigm that we described in the sense that if you uh, remove this edge from, or this input that comes from the question and goes into the neural network, what you have in a way is a actual a representation of the meaning of the text as well. It's just that this representation will be based on, I don't know whether you guys see me pointing at this, probably not, uh, but like, around the first vector of this image, uh, what you have there is an actual representation of the meaning of the text, which is general in the sense that it has nothing to do with the question that is fed in, and hence it's actually quite similar to meaning representation earlier. It's just not symbolic, it's uh, neural and, and vector-based, but in, in a way it's solving the same need. Unfortunately, in practice, what we have been focusing a lot is actually architectures where the questions hit the representation so early that you really cannot speak or understand the intermediate neural representation that you create in the same sense as you understand the symbolic representations that we extract in knowledge-based population and semantic parsing. And this will be sort of like a topic of this, uh, of this tutorial in the, the next couple of, of minutes. Okay, so before I go into more detail, one more question is what do we need from these representations? Like what, we, what do we want from them, independent of how they look like? Because first, usually we want to resolve in these representations the ambiguity that is inherent in natural language. There are usually different ways of interpreting the same type of word, for example, in different contexts, and that needs to be resolved and represented. Likewise, we want to unify the variation that we have in language. That is, often there are very many ways to express the same thing uh, for the purposes of, of your downstream application, and it's important to unify these variations and give them a, a shared common representation. And then finally, we want to be able to integrate distributed information. For example, if you have several documents, you like to be able to integrate information from these several documents into one unified representation. So with this in mind, let's look, let's look at automatic knowledge-based construction as one way of doing machine reading, where we really produce this symbolic knowledge graph from text. So we're gonna look at, at essentially this, this picture here, and in particular, we're gonna look at the left side, and in the process of going from text to that graph. And uh, slightly more formally, we're trying to build a function R that maps text to representation Y. In this function, we actually go through a step, a sequence of steps. In the first step, we're extracting entities and we type them. And usually this is happening through some form of sequence labeling. Um, for example, if you had three types, A, not an entity, B, person, and, uh, and C, location, then in this particular example here, you'd label two of as not an entity, Tesla as a person, the rest here also is not an entity, and uh, Gospitch and Prague as um, locations. And the way you usually do this is, uh, at least in the good old days, purely through linear chain conditional random fields, which I assume most of you are familiar with. Uh, 
there certainly work that just lo looks at some form of bidirectional RNN to, to solve this problem. Uh, but actually, as it turns out, today, the most dominant and, and the most successful models, they're actually hybrids in the sense that they combine linear chain CRFs with uh, um, recurrent neural networks. And I think that's quite interesting because I guess I'm happy about uh, seeing graphical models somehow still being uh, useful and important in, in our field, which is not necessarily the case everywhere. Okay, let's, let's quickly go into that. Um, and again, reminding you of ambiguity. If you see a word Tesla here without context, you don't know whether that's a person or a brand. It could be the car or it could be the, uh, the person. It could be another person called Tesla as well. Um, the way that uh, state-of-the-art models handle this is by essentially still building up a probabilistic model of a sequence of variables. Each of these circles are the variables in this model and each of these nodes correspond to what is the label for the corresponding token at that position. So in, a, in this case, Tesla would get the label P for person, everything else gets the label O for not a person or outside of a person. And uh, this distribution P of Y given X is essentially a product of potentials, one for each token. For each of these potentials measures how well does my label at that token uh, match the input X that I'm seeing, and a couple of pairwise potentials that capture how much do the uh, labels, the consecutive labels in this, uh, in this sequence, how much do they match? Like, is it, is it okay to have a person following a not a person label? Um, so that's essentially good old CRFs, nothing new. What's interesting today is that the local potentials here are not feature-based, but they're purely based on uh, RNN representations that you produce by essentially going uh, first, taking a vector that is a function of a vector of the, right, uh, of the right neighbor, which again is a function of a vector of that right neighbor. And so, so this is a way to see the right-hand side of, your, of your, your token, and the same on the left side. So you get essentially vector representations feeding in from the right and feeding in from the, uh, from the left. And these vector representations are just the um, essentially output or the context vectors that you get in your RNN, which themselves are fed by word embeddings on the lowest level. And you can do the same thing with uh, pretty much all the potentials here. And that's how uh, the current architectures for sequence labeling in NER and part of speech tagging and uh, in other sequential tasks in NLP look like. And uh, this currently works best. And to me, as I said earlier, this is somewhat exciting because I was sort of intuitively guessing that with these um, local potentials that essentially see the whole sentence, you wouldn't need to worry about the pairwise interactions and constraints between label transitions, but somehow this is still important. And modeling this, modeling this directly in a linear chain CRF is actually quite, uh, quite helpful in terms of empirical results that we're seeing. Uh, notice that you can also use these vector representations to uh, condition the, the pairwise potentials, but I find it easier to think just about the local potentials in this case. All right, um, just quickly in terms of how we train this, usually when we look at NER, we have direct supervision at training time, meaning that we have per token labels that we get from a uh, corpus of, um, of uh, NER tags associated with tokens. And uh, I'm saying this here now because this is to be contrasted with other types of supervision we'll see later on. When did I start this game? Okay, okay. Um, so once we have labeled these, uh, these mentions, we uh, can extract from these, from these mentions and the sequences, we can extract the actual nodes of the graph that we want to produce. So we take Tesla and create a node with it. We take Prague and create a node with it. Do the same thing with Gospage. And we can also instantiate for the pronouns here uh, nodes in the graph that correspond to these pronouns. And these will be useful later on. Um, and this is essentially our first sort of uh, part of the function mapping from, from text to meaning representation. In the next step, we're going to look at what's called relation extraction. And this is the task of figuring out what are the semantic relations between these nodes. And uh, in particular, what we're going to do here is find out that uh, in this case, him, 
Tesla moved to Prague and that uh, leaving Gospic for Prague is a way of saying moving to Prague in this case. So this is a form of uh, unifying variation in the sense that we'll try and map several ways of expressing the move to relationship to this move to label. And once we have done that in the text and we link these mentions, we can correspondently link the, uh, the entities in the graph. And uh, at that point, we have produced another intermediate step in our meaning representation. Note that we have now pipelined this, right? So uh, we have first created the nodes using a probabilistic model. And now we're producing the relations based on the um, entities that we have extracted in the, um, in the previous step. And again, this will be a theme throughout uh, the next couple of slides. The way that relation extraction is handled is, is quite similar in a way that a lot relies today on essentially neural classification models or what I would call neural potentials or neural local potentials. Um, but there's also this additional aspect that I think has seen most of the interesting work in this field, which is on distance supervision. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so the core challenge that we have to deal with in uh, relation extraction is dealing with variation. As I said, there might be several ways of expressing the move to relation. And we want to make sure that all of these are mapped to a single move to label or predicate. The way this happens, as I said, is essentially via uh, what I call also these, these local potentials uh, that are again fed through or by some vector representations of the actual input X. So somehow you're gonna represent him and you're gonna represent leave Gosbridge four and you're gonna represent Prague using say an RNN model as we did earlier. And that feeds that potential which you then uh, train to uh, do well on the task. So that's, that's fine and there are all kinds of variations of this which I think are, are not as interesting as is the fact that usually we don't have annotated training data on these labels. Because asking people to do all of this uh, is a lot of work and it doesn't scale as well. What we do have though is um, essentially what we call entity-wide labels. For example, we have the Wikidata knowledge base. And in the Wikidata knowledge base, there's a triple that says Tesla moved to Prague, right? And so this, this triple doesn't tell us necessarily where this fact was mentioned, but it does tell us that these things are, these two entities are related. So what we can do is we can somehow connect this variable representing the triple to the per mention variables that represent the documents and the uh, fact whether a relation is expressed in these documents. And we can connect these through some kind of potential, then do inference in this model and figure out that at training time, um, maybe all of these three um, mentions of Tesla or him and Prague are actually um, in the move to relationship. And uh, while this looks kind of simple because you can say, ah, oh, you know, it's the only thing you have to do is use the label uh, that you have in your uh, knowledge base and use it to label each individual um, instance. In reality, there is uh, obviously cases where you talk about Tesla and you talk about Prague, but they aren't in the, um, in the actual relation that you have in your, in your knowledge base. So if Tesla visited Prague, doesn't mean that he actually moved to Prague, he just visited it. So what happens really in this field is uh, a lot of people are trying to find ways of, of inferring these latent variables in, in, uh, in better ways to deal with the fact that just because it's in the knowledge base, it doesn't mean that each mention uh, requires uh, to be a relation of this type. And uh, there's a lot of work there. I'm not gonna go into detail, but uh, we have pointers for that. And I'm happy to talk about it offline. So once you have found the relation, the next thing you need to do uh, is to figure out that in this case, for example, him actually refers to Tesla, right? Because as such, like the graph isn't really that useful because I can't just figure out what happened to Tesla because I still don't know whether Tesla is him or uh, whether him is Tesla or somebody else in that document. So I need to find out this link. And once I have this, I can collapse this graph further. Um, at which point I have now a three-step pipeline uh, where I first did N NER or named entity recognition, then I did relation extraction, and then I did uh, co-reference resolution. 
Now, the way that uh, co-reference is done today is again somewhat similar in the sense that you find these local neural potentials that I already mentioned. Uh, but then there is, I think, a quite interesting way of how current state of the art and co-reference deals with the inference problem in the graphical models. And I'd like to talk about that a tiny bit. All right, so the way that I think traditionally co-reference has been handled is as, in a way, a graphical model that looks like this. You have a binary variable for each possible mention and each possible uh, antecedent or previous mention that this entity or mention can refer to. So for they, there's only one possible antecedent, namely voters, that it can link to. And uh, the decision in this variable can either be a yes, it links to it, or no, it doesn't link to it. When you look at, uh, and then you have some kind of potential there that measures how well does uh, voters and they match, how well does the text in between fit to a co-reference uh, decision, and so on and so forth. You have the same variables for chance, and now there are two variables, one for does it link to voters, and one for does it link to they. And uh, again, you can have uh, local potentials on those that, that um, value good match between um, antecedents and the actual mention. Um, and then likewise, you do the same thing for the final mention here. Now, that is okay and actually works rel relatively well. But one of the uh, core challenges in this, uh, in this setup is the fact that inference in the above model is hard. And that's not obvious when you look at this model because I dropped essentially a, uh, a major potential or constraint here. There is essentially for each triple of variables here, there is a constraint that captures the transitivity of the pairwise co-reference uh, relation. That is, if they here, um, if they four is co-referent with they two, and they two is co-referent with voters, then they four also need to be co-referent with uh, voters. That means that uh, these three variables, they're all interconnected. And you can't make these decisions in isolation without risking violating this transitivity constraint, essentially. And uh, when you populate this whole network, with all of these factors, you get a extremely high tree width uh, network in which inference becomes quite tricky. And we have found all kinds of ways of dealing with this, but what turned out to work best is, is something quite, uh, quite simple. And uh, it is to completely reformulate this problem and um, asking instead of finding all the possible links between mentions and their antecedents, only find the best antecedent per mention that you have. That is, um, for example, for they, the best antecedent is voters, as before. And so now we have a variable here uh, that indicates not a yes or no, but the index of the, um, of the token that you're pointing to. So voters, or they, refers to voters. Um, chance refers to nothing because it's a new cluster. And uh, they on four refers also to voters. Right. So now I've decided that the best uh, antecedent for they four is actually voters or not, not they two. And once I define the, the problem in this way, I have no more constraints on the structure. So like, you can actually choose these labels in any way and you always get a consistent uh, co-reference structure. And from this structure on the lower level, you can infer the actual pairwise structure directly but uh, you have sort of gotten rid of the, the constraint that uh, there needs to be this transitivity bit. There are things that you lose in this, so uh, and we can talk about that, but it definitely got easier, uh, and uh, at least empirically, with uh, not too much cost. So this is really the way that the problem is handled right now. Um, the problem, the, I mean, the only problem is that actually, uh, in terms of the training data that we have, we have no notion of what the best antecedent is. This is sort of like a made up concept that we made up, but like an auxiliary variable that we made up just to simplify the inference problem. There is no, there is no such data that says this is the best antecedent. The only data that we have is the full clustering information that we get from our standard data sets. But uh, what you can do is you can simply marginalize out um, the, uh, the latent variables when you train this model and, and Train, uh, train it through the supervision you have on the observed variables. 
and uh, that actually works quite well. Again, the actual models and the potentials you find on these nodes, they're all neural and uh, use RNNs um, as, as much as possible, possible also CNNs, but in terms of the probabilistic structure, the models look like this right now. Okay, um, notice that this kind of gets us uh, you know, relatively far along the way in terms of the results that we see. Co-reference, I think, is still one of the hardest tasks in NLP, and you'll see why that is the case. Um, but on the sort of easier cases, we're actually getting quite far. So whenever you can make decisions kind of on the surface level without looking much into the semantics of it, you're good. But the minute you have uh, more complex uh, phenomena like this one, where the trophy could not fit into the brown suitcase because it was too big, um, where it's clear that the uh, it for us should go to the trophy, uh, whereas when it was too small, it goes to the actual uh, suitcase. Like that's something where you really need to understand the world to make that happen. And by no way have we really solved that problem at, uh, at this point. All right, so now to the final step of this whole AKBC or automated knowledge base construction process. Um, what we've done so far is we've been building individual knowledge graphs on a per document basis. So we have uh, essentially figured out that the Tesla maybe in this document has a node uh, corresponding to it and uh, the Tesla in the second document also has a node corresponding to it and um, that um, there are some relations that we extracted for these but we haven't yet really integrated these documents. And in particular, we're not quite sure whether the Tesla in the second document refers to the Tesla of the first document. In this case, that's not, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So um, usually there's some kind of fixed uh, dictionary assumed here, but like there's also been a lot of work on, on working with open uh, dictionaries in that way, but I'm not gonna touch that, touch that here. So, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so in this case, there is no link between um, the two Teslas, but uh, in this case, for example, there would be such a link. And in this, if there is such a link, or like in order to find out whether um, this Tesla actually belongs to the Tesla of the first uh, document, the way we handle that is again using neural potentials and actually believe propagation. Um, was again happy to see that uh, the current state of the art model for, co for entity linking actually use a form of uh, loopy belief propagation in order to, uh, to uh, infer these, um, these entity links. And the way it does that is, um, or the actual graphical model that it uses to do this is a per document graphical model um, where you have for each of your mentions in that document, you have one variable uh, indicating whether this belongs to Tesla the person, for example, or Tesla the, the car, and uh, whether the other variable or the other mention belongs to um, Gospic in, um, damn it, where's Gospic? I forgot. I, all right, anyway, uh, it's the, I mean, I roughly know where it is, I just forgot whether it's, anyway, this is too embarrassing. Um, so, um, now, the reason that you actually have a graphical model um, to do this is, uh, again, because you have these, these neural local potentials, which are, you know, in a way, you don't need to worry about a graphical model here. But what you also have is a pairwise potential between the uh, decisions that you're making that captures the fact that if you're talking about um, Tesla, the person, it's more likely to talk about Gospic, the, the city where he might have moved to back then, uh, then, then about other things. So there are connections between the decisions that you're making on a per document basis and your graph graphical model will figure or will capture this as well. And again, that graphical model will be, uh, or the, the binary potentials in this graphical model, they will be fed by, the, um, by some kind of uh, neural network and uh, say RNN representation that uh, looks at essentially the relation in the document between these two mentions. Once you have done this, you can collapse the node further and uh, you're pretty much there. This is the type of graph that we wanted to construct uh, in the beginning of the, of the 
of the tutorial. And what you've done now is you've done essentially like three steps of pipelining. You did the NER, you did the relation extraction, you did the co-reference, and then you did the entity linking. Um, now, one of the core issues with this approach is the uh, problem of cascading errors. Because you've done all of this pipelining, uh, errors multiply and errors in the entity linking, you know, they will produce errors in the relation extraction and so on and so forth. And so this actually is a big source of errors that um, we have to deal with. It actually gets even worse in the sense that if your task is a natural language question answering and your input is a natural language question, um, then, and if you want to use this knowledge base, then you have to do another bit of uh, processing, um, namely from the question to, uh, and the input representation to the answer. And usually within that transformation, you have to convert that question into a sort of SQL query on that graph. And that process again is noisy. So you're gonna make an error there as well, most of the time. Meaning that in order to answer this whole question answering uh, problem, there are just a lot of cascading, cascading errors that you have to, have to deal with. Another problem is the actual difficulty of engineering the schemas and formalisms that you use to represent this knowledge. So maybe like representing where somebody moves to when, that's not too difficult. You have edges that go from where they, uh, who they are to where they move to, and maybe you add some uh, dates to that. That's okay, but uh, even if you wanna ask something like, why did he not enroll? And even if that information is actually literally in the text, you have to think a bit about how to represent this. For example, you could have, you could have a not enroll event and then you would have something like a reason edge from that to uh, the too late you know, uh, reason. And all of that is possible, but if you put a few um, linguists and semanticists in a room and try to agree on this, it'll take ages and you're not gonna really make much progress. Um, so that by itself is actually a big cost of, of coming up with knowledge base um, representations of the content that you care about. Like just getting that right actually takes time. Um, then finally, and related to this, like once you have a slightly more complex representation of meaning, um, it is actually quite difficult for annotators to produce annotations like that. So if you ask somebody, okay, like I'm gonna give you the sentence here, can you build the knowledge graph for it? It would take them quite a while to, uh, to do this and, and even more importantly, they most likely make mistakes on it in the sense that people will not agree on this and you get low inter-annotator agreement between the different annotations. Um, it turns out it's much, much easier for annotators to answer just the question and answers that you care about in the first place. So if you ask uh, people, can you take this document and think about a few questions that it answers and then point me in the document to the answers of these questions, they actually agree with quite uh, high uh, agreement numbers. And in fact, people have been doing research in NLP where they took a couple of tasks that traditionally were uh, essentially based on semantic representations, symbolic representations, and replaced them with I guess, uh, question answering annotations. Uh, agreement rates really went up quite substantially. It's just much easier for people to think in terms of questions and answers than in terms of the formalisms that somebody makes up in order to represent meaning. Um, and all of that, I guess, leads us to question, is there maybe another way to think about this whole process of getting from a question to an answer? Uh, and I guess one answer is to say, well, let's drop this whole thing altogether and learn a function that essentially goes from the text and the question to the answer. And um, this is what Johannes is gonna talk about in this part of the tutorial. <laughs> <laughs>